If these songs sound familiar to you, they all share one common ingredient. They were all written and or produced by our next guest, Billboard charting artist, multiple Grammy award winning songwriter and producer. You're not going to want to miss this. Welcome to Bass Bin TV. Here we are in the studio with none other than Aldo Nova. It's funny, you don't look alive. <laughs> <laughs> so strange, you know, for somebody who's alive, you look dead. I am a long time. very, very, very much alive. <laughs> uh, I'm here with Kayla Winter, and uh, we're going to be talking to Aldo. This is super, super important. Okay. You, as a young, up and coming, not even a musician yet, listening to CKGM, listening to your favorite bands, Growing up, how did you transition from listening to music to all of a sudden saying, at 15, I want to start playing guitar. I want, I want to, be, to be more tactical in my life. I don't want to just be a listener. I want to be a performer. What was the pivotal thing that changed in your life uh, that transitioned to that? Well, I was always like at four years old. I used to pass by a, a dipanar. I don't know how you say that in English, but a, a store. A convenience and, store. Yeah. And they used to have a ukulele up in the window. And every day I'd, you know, I'd pass by that thing and my mother and I said, can I get that ukulele? And so she eventually bought me the ukulele. So I posed in front of the mirror with the ukulele. <laughs> and then one day my brother sat on it and he broke the neck. And then he put it together and put it in a, with fire or something. And it was like this short. So I couldn't play but the actual catalyst for me to play um, guitar was uh, my mom died suddenly. And uh, so I had the blues quite a bit. So I asked my brother to buy me a guitar. So we went up to St. Denis on the second floor uh, music shop. And he bought me a $20 guitar and a $20 amp. And that's it. I never looked back. I stayed for my room for two years without... I just went out to go to school and to eat. And uh, that's about it. That's how I learned. After two years, I was really, really good when I came out. And then at 15, I was already playing in high schools. And then after right. 17, I was uh, playing in clubs, earning my living. So. so from the time of playing clubs, there's this huge, I mean, trajectory of you playing live, doing clubs, doing venues, and learning your craft. So you play guitar, but you also learn piano. So that piano came in later in your career? Yeah, piano was sort of... More for songwriting? Like, uh, well, I still write all my songs on piano. Right. But very rarely do I write a song on guitar. But you were saying that your first instruments were the ukulele and then a guitar. So I'm curious why you choose to write mainly on keys. I think it gives you a more open space. You can play your... You can hear your basses. And you can hear, actually hear the whole song... You know, left and right hand. Whereas on the guitar, you just basically strum. Right. But you know, I can I can play a song on the guitar and it still sound like a full band. When you started um, with those initial instruments, was there an album that you gravitated towards? Like, what was the first album that really got you hooked and kind of propelled this passion for music? I think the first. My my brother used to have a pretty good record collection. The first song I actually tripped on was. Uh, Van Morrison, Brown Eyed Girl. Mm -hmm. So I really like that. 
And then he had the Beach Boys and all that stuff and all. And then there was Ralph Lockwood and CKGM. I mean, radio, uh, AFM, AM radio back then was just cool. I mean, it was just like all the hits and everything. They used to have Creedence Clearwater, all those those great bands. And now you don't hear nothing on the radio. There's no, nothing. it's kind of the same stuff, just cycling <laughs> over and over every yeah. hour, unfortunately. Did you have support from your parents growing up? In- no, my dad was like, you're not going to go to school. You're not going to play guitar. You're going to come with me in the steel factory and work with me to be a warrior. Yeah, my which, I, which I did. Yeah, I met on it. What? <laughs> really? And you did that? Of course I did. For how long? Uh, I was a welder and I worked. Uh, I used to go work in the summer, uh, when summer vacation since I was 12 in the steel factory. And then... When I was 15, I was still working there <clears throat> full time. And that was a dangerous job because I'm a klutz and my wife will testify to the fact that I'm a klutz. <laughs> I'll fall anywhere. You just give me a, anything, a wire, <laughs> a, a little, a rock, a stick of sand and I'll kill myself on it. At what point did you say, dad, that's enough. I'm not, I'm not doing this anymore. I used to go by, uh, my strings and stuff like that at a, a place called Bel Air Music. So I used to go there, and you know, the guy liked my personality. He says, do you want to come and work here? And I said, excuse me, uh, fuck yeah, I'm going to come here no in way. a second. Yeah, it's like, that's how I started getting jobs for clubs. People used to come and see me, and I used to show them the synths, used to play guitar. And then a guy said, uh, do, you wanna, do you want to come and play clubs? And I said, sure, I'll take it. And how old were you when, when that started? 17. So 17. So you're out in clubs, underage, mm-hmm. playing bars. Why the worst, not? There was no thing as underage. Yeah. <laughs> True. <laughs> there was no child labor True. laws. It, if you go back that far, I mean, we had, it was like the Wild West. But, uh, you know, so I, I, at 17, uh, I started working in the shop, started working in clubs. And so I'd, I'd work at the daytimes at the music store. Night in clubs, and I'd go back home, sleep, and then start the cycle over again. Uh, one night I was playing in a club, and uh, this guy came to ask me, do you write songs? And I don't think I'd ever written a song, and I said yes. And uh, he asked me, do you know how to record? And I said yes, I never recorded. <laughs> Fake it till you Just make it. Say yes. Just typical li- typical say yes. Li- typical liar. <laughs> and uh, and uh and he said, well, you know, I have a record deal, but I don't sing and I don't play guitar and I don't, I don't write songs. He was, but I, I, I've got the deal. I basically said, yeah. So I had this big synth. It was a CS80. It was a Yamaha. It weighed 150 pounds, mm-hmm. this thing. So, uh, Without the case, 150 and I, and pounds. I had uh, 500 vinyls and I had my Les Pauls, my basses, everything. And I used to live in the basement. And so I got broken into and they robbed everything, uh, except they couldn't get rid of, they couldn't lift the, the keyboard to get it through. <laughs> Just so leave getting, that. <laughs> so getting back to the guy. Just leave it behind. Uh, I had written a song on that keyboard, which was a very, back then the style <clears throat> in 1979 was like New Wave. It was like mm-hmm. Gary Newman. It mm-hmm. was like Joe Jackson. It was yep. like Elvis Costello. So I wrote a song that was New Wave, and it did. It was called XR7. And so I wrote it on this keyboard, and then gave me access to a studio, Bobby Nesson, on uh, downtown in uh, Old Montreal. And so um, I started going and doing his demos there. And so he got the deal, it came out. And uh, <clears throat> I remember the first time I was lying in bed, I used to sleep with the radio on, and one morning I woke up and that song was on the radio. So I was like, wow, that's it. And again, like that's as, as today, I didn't make one royalty on it. But So that kept going. And I recorded six songs. And they were all like that. And then one day they just skipped out on the bill. And so the studio knew I was doing everything. So they said, well, you either give me $10,000 or you, Ugh. or can we, we can give you access to the studio and we can keep going. So I chose the, the latter. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> sure. That's a smart move. Well, the smart only move. move. <laughs> so then I used to be working the day job, playing the clubs, and then after the clubs at 3 o'clock in the morning, I used to go in the studio and record my demos. 
Mm. And then I start up again in the morning. So I did that for a long time. So then these were your your personal demos then. You weren't writing for someone else. You were writing for yourself at this point? At that point, I was writing for myself, yeah. So from that point, what was the next step? Did you have to uh, send out press kits? Like, how did you go from there to then working alongside Tony Bon Jovi at his studio, Power Station? Uh, what happened is that I had made a demo tape and the demo tape made it into the hands. Back then, I don't know if you still have it. I was, uh, it was the thing in um, a conference in uh, Paris that was called Me Dem, mm -hmm. where all the publishers used to go. Mm -hmm. And so I had this woman that went to the tape that knew the president of ATV Music. And so <clears throat> the guy just gave it to the assistant like that. And the guy liked it. And he came to Montreal. He met me and they signed me as a writer right away. Wow. So then I was making, so once I had, a, once I was given the choice to do uh, open, instead of doing New Wave, I went to the rock stuff. So I started writing Under the Gun and things like that and fantasy and, and. Uh, More from your influences, from your, your days of listening yeah, to like. Yeah, from the club days. Yeah, I of mean, course. You know, it's like everything is, my stuff, my first album is all my influences put together. Right. You have the. The background vocals from the, the gang vocals from Queen. You have right. the rock guitars. You have the synths. Uh, it's all a thing. So then we went to a, a record company called... Uh, so half the record was rock. Half the record was New Wave. Mm. So we went to this record company. And the guy said, well, you only have half an album. And they said, well, the rock side is what we go. Uh, you should go for it. So I did uh, the whole album rock. Right. And so ATV then signed me as an artist which you weren't allowed to do. They shouldn't, you shouldn't have done that. That was illegal. And then they rented me out to CBS. So then the guy that was uh, Portrait Records, they had signed Boston, they had signed Hart, and he came up to Montreal and he saw me. And I was it was so funny because I was in the studio. Uh, again, I had the keyboard here, I had uh, the microphone there, and I was engineering. And I was doing background vocals to Ball and Chain, and the guy was like, "Wow, this guy does a lot of stuff." So, so it, it was funny. It was fun because I played the guitar, I, right? I, you know, I played keyboards, I sang everything, I engineered everything, and the only thing I can't play is is, is drums. So, apart from that, I was going to say that's the only thing that I, I think I remember, like as far as production wise, that you needed drummers. That was exactly, the only yeah. thing. Yeah. But I, I'm a terrible drummer, but I'm, I can program drums like you can't tell like now anymore. Do, do you know that there are people that are out there on YouTube listening to your tracks and actually like going, whoa, this is cool. Have you ever well, seen that? Yeah, I mean, I, I've had uh, three million views in the last two months on Fantasy, the first video. Oh, yeah. And I never, I went from 11, 11 million to 19 million in the space of a year. Yeah, you're over 19 million on that. And I, 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 I was like, and, and, wow. Uh, that happened just recently. It's like every every month, it's like another million. It's like people go, oh, wow, who's this guy? Are you taking advantage of like all of those streams? No, I'm the worst social media guy. I mean, I have a fan page and everyone, and I post. And right. It's about it. And you can tell it's me that posts. I mean, I write like, right. in the right. same way I talk. <laughs> and uh, it's not, uh, it's very personal. And I don't do Instagram. I don't do Twitter. Right. I don't do any of that stuff. I don't have time to do it. So it's Facebook and YouTube. Facebook and YouTube, yeah. YouTube, and YouTube right. actually revived my career. So my wife, we got over these little, these little cameras. I think they were one shots. And she set up one camera, and then I played uh, Paradise. And that was one take with, to a backing track. And so I put it up. And then there was comments like, wow, this guy's still alive? I mean, it's like, I thought this guy was dead. He, you know, it's like, so... So we got like a, a bunch of views on that, like 15,000 views. And then I started doing other ones and other ones. And, and it just kept on going up. Kept going. And then I did the fantasy one. That's at half a million now. That's not bad. I wanted to show you something super funny. And I thought absolutely awesome. And when we were talking about like the crossover, there are people that had never heard of you before listening to your music reacting to hearing your song oh, yeah. for the there's, first there's time a lot of those, there's a lot of those guys check, i from. want you to i want you to check this one out <laughs> they're so into it right from the get-go oh 
Oh. <laughs> Are you kidding? <laughs> like she's right. Every different section, See? they react. I love this. I like the guy on the right. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, no. He's... The, guy, the guy on the left is sort of like going, what is this? So it's like, I don't know what's going on. The guy on the right is just like starting to go, okay. Because they're listening to the lyrics. And they're really paying attention. Because watch. Like, how much better a reaction to listening to a song for the first time? Like, people today are, are tapping into new, new and old music equally. They're discovering things, and it's because of social media, because of YouTube, because of, you know, Instagram, Twitter, whatever. It's like, everything's, like, directing people into, like, places that they would probably not go before. You know, and if we can talk about fantasy for a moment, it was is one of your your biggest tracks it really sets you onto a forward trajectory um for the younger people who are watching the people who are kind of getting their career started we always have this idea that there's going to be this defining moment where you know our career just takes off this is it i've made it do you feel like fantasy was that for you was there a moment for you uh, that record went double platinum because of that song, like in three months. I mean, you know, it's yeah. like it was like top eight on the Billboard charts, but that just took off. But the company was really did a lot of promotion, mm -hmm. did like uh, everything. And, and I was on tour eight months before that record came out, so uh, my manager mm -hmm. had me out on tour, so I didn't even have a chance to to realize what was happening until it happened. It happened, and then. And uh, then I was right away had to do another album. Then I wrote my subject album. Speaking of doing something with technology, limited technology, if you listen to my subject album, it's like out there. I mean, you know. Right. Well, you also have your rock opera album, mm -hmm. uh, which is super important. And uh, that's what's going on right now. It's called The Life and Times of Eddie Gage. I had it. Right there. <laughs> I brought my own stuff because you wouldn't buy it. The, I buy everything. I'm tactical. I'll still buy. If I don't buy a hard CD, I will buy it on iTunes. I don't stream. I don't even, I don't even actually uh, subscribe to uh, a Spotify or any streaming uh, platforms because until writers get the royalties mm -hmm. that they deserve, I'm doing my little part, which is super small, to like stand my ground and go, I'll, I'll, I'd rather buy it on iTunes. So... This album, now this is something, you, you sent me the, you know, a track a while back. It was like Beatles meets Progressive meets like, it was amazing. Like the chord, the, the whole progressions and the chord changes in this, these songs. There's never eight bars where it's like stays the same. No. I just felt like, oh my God, I'm like taking on a journey. So you never get bored. You never get you never get bored. So tell me about this record and what what got you to like to go to that that direction. And that, this well, and the whole record now is twenty five songs and uh, two hours and ten minutes long. <laughs> so that's and, and that hasn't come out, and I'm not letting it out at all right. till I actually have a ground base of touring right. and everything, and where it's like we have more of a a base where people know more about me right. Uh, that record started in 2008 because I went from a transition to being an artist to being a songwriter. And I went from doing A New Day Has Come. And uh, mm. that went really, that was like the number okay. one. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. She's a local artist. So I, I'd done yeah. that and I'd done the... Um, I'd done the writer's stuff where, they, where you go to Sweden and they put you... Um, because I was signed to a publishing company. Mm. I've always been signed to a publishing company. And they stick you in a room with three guys, two other guys, and you just have to write a song. And you have to write two songs or three songs a day. Mm. So you have uh, two hours with this, these two guys, two hours with those two guys, two hours with those two guys, or, or women, you know? So um, 
and uh, you just have to write a song. So I did that, and I did that for uh, for a long time. And then in 2008, I said, uh, and I'm just going to, you know, it's like too many people got rich and they made millions, and right. I was still living in St. Lazar, the same house. But a new day, I mean, a song like that. So explain to some of the younger generation today that think that sometimes, you know, all it takes is one song to you know, make and break your career and, and settle you. Sometimes deals go bad. Sometimes deals aren't really in your favor. Most of the time, most record deals are not made for the artist. They're made for the label to protect them, for them to be able to monetize from your talent. And yeah. most of the time, artists get screwed more than anyone really realizes. Do you realize that I saw my first royalty from my first album, a month, a month ago, and it was all of a two hundred and sixty-five dollars. What? Uh, <laughs> and then they withheld thirty. No, it was four hundred and fifty-four dollars U.S. That then they withheld thirty percent withholding tax, so it turned out to be one hundred and fifty-seven dollars after forty-two years. Was that from a, for, for yeah. what was that from BMI or because no, of in the it states? Was from Sony Music. It was from Sony Music. Yeah. How does that happen? Uh, uh, that's that's that, a whole that other like the managers the record company I, I ended up with like two points everybody ended up making mm -hmm. a lot of money right so and then on top of that even now then they uh, try to get paid and they say well we sent the money and the money's never there so I have to send like a hundred like let's see the last time it was like which was recently I sent like 45 emails 12 messages till finally yesterday I finally got them to admit that oh sorry the the, the the bank transfer came back, so we'll send it to you again today. But if you don't keep on their case, it's like it's ridiculous. But what about like even uh, bands, you know, like uh, uh, Lali, that your song, the song Aki. Yeah, Aki, and uh, that was like a Dini. Grammy Award, a Latin Grammy Award winning song. So oh, how do you how do you even get involved in writing? Like, first of all, do you speak Spanish? Like, how do the were there lyrics involved, or you wrote the song? You wrote the, the, wrote the song. The music, yeah. You wrote all the music for that. So how did you even? How do you actually transition to that? How how did that happen to go from a Chilean rock band? The engineer that uh, I worked with on Chilean stuff, and that I worked with uh, is that Umberto Garu Umberto Gatiga. Yeah, for sure. And um, he comes to me one day. He goes, "I have this Chilean rock band," and he goes, "I want you to write demos with them." Mm. So uh, Beto Cuevas came over to Montreal to my place, and we wrote a key, and then we wrote Fuera de Mi, and then I demoed them, and then we went down to L.A. and played them for the manager, and he goes, wow, this is amazing. Wow. And so we want you to come up and do this stuff. So they came up, and uh, it's funny because I was recording the English version of, uh, I was coaching the English version of Notre Dame de Paris. Mm. And... Uh, with uh, Richard Cochante and uh, uh, Plamondon. Mm. So in the daytime, I was doing that. And then one, one day I was at home and I got a knock on my door and it's the band. Wow. And I said, but I wasn't expecting you guys. I mean, it's like. <laughs> they just I, showed I up not, on your doorstep? I was not stuff? expecting you guys here. It was, yeah, well, we're here. And Bertha told us to come. <laughs> so then I was working two jobs again. And then we did all the pre production. I did the, the, the drums, the, you know, I had, it's all, everybody that's playing on that record is just my guys. Yes. So they just showed up and I used, I did it with all my crew and it's all my tracks. And then I sent it down to Umberto that just re-recorded some parts and put it out. And it was really successful. Like he was like nominated for a Latin Grammy. They won a Latin Grammy. They won a Latin Grammy they award Latin for that. Grammy, yeah. yeah. Which, uh, but I didn't get a Latin Grammy. I mean, there's another thing of getting screwed. I mean, right. you know, in, in, you know, I was supposed to think as Umberto said, okay, well, I'll co we'll co-produce it together. We'll get half the royalties. And I just found out after that reading uh, Discogs that they had won a like, Grammy and everything. So it's like, uh, yeah, you know, it's it's like there's another thing. So I'm, getting back to uh, Lifetimes of Engage, after things like that. I said in 2008, I'm just tired. You know, right. I'm really like tired. I just want to do my own thing. Right. Even if it meant like starving and going poor, poor sure. uh, which I did. And uh, 
uh, I decided I never work with anybody, never write for anybody anymore, and just write for me. And right. So the way I, that's the way I enjoy writing the most, getting inspired and writing and doing some stuff. So, unfortunately, when you say I did that, uh, with working with them is that that nobody else knows that I right. did that except that <laughs> right. you know, they did that. You know, it's like <laughs> and it's like I wrote in the days come, but it's Celine Dion song. So how important is that for you, Ali? Anyway, I I do it not for fame. It's like even now I'm not doing. I'm not. I don't want to be famous, but I want to be uh, respected and I want to be recognized for my talent. Do you think that that's is that success to you? Is having your peers at least respect what you do, respect yeah, what you bring? I've already have that. I mean, my mm-hmm. peers already know that mm-hmm. I'm a badass, so it's like I don't have to worry about that. So no, so I decided to just start doing my own thing. So I'd written seven, eight songs, and I called Angie and I said, "Well, I have eight songs," and then I went with my acoustic guitar recorded the basic tracks, just acoustic, and then mm-hmm. she came in and did drums, and I built from there. Right. And then after that, it took nine songs in 2008, 2009. Uh, then I wrote the other, a couple in 2011. I didn't want to push it. I wanted to write straight from inspiration. Sure. And not, you know, not straight from writing a piano, and I have to write a song today. And then some in 2013, some in 2015. And a bunch of them in 2019. I was really inspired 2019. Having time on your side, that's obviously your, your advantage, you know, to your yeah. advantage now. It, it, it was uh, to my advantage to make like a great album. Right. Want, it's also to my disadvantage that, that I was out of the, spot, the limelight for so long. Right. And so now that I have these albums, and I made five during the, to the last, like, I mean, I made... Uh, Eddie Gage on April 1st came out, then April 19th Reloaded came out, then in May I had the three song EP short stories, then Sonic Hallucinations, and now just May 19th I put out uh, Nobody's Dream. You're on a roll. So yeah, well, uh, you know, I had, I had a lot of stuff, you know. <laughs> and we had a lot of time within the last, like, at least two solid years of pandemic, to, I didn't right? I write a thing during the pandemic. Really? So you were, like, actually promoting yourself and going, hey, here I am, but that was just basically just a shout-out to say, yeah, by the way. Well, I was doing the tracks for Reloaded. I, I used to record those tracks, and then I used, I used to make versions mm-hmm. that for live, and then I'd record those and make a, a video. And... Um, I would take my monthly shower and <laughs> do my hair, and then I would film my uh, monthly video. <laughs> was it only once a month that you'd put out a video? Yeah, well, yeah, well, yeah something like that. Like, okay. I thought you were going to ask me, was it month a month if you don't take a shower? <laughs> That's only if I need it. <laughs> Figured, you know, it's like at one point your, your wife, Sylvie, would probably say, it's time. <laughs> like it's every time. night, every You're, night. Yeah, the, the, the limit, is, you've reached the... You've reached the limit. Yeah, it's time. like every night. So, yeah. So I did these videos, and like I said, it picked up. and They're amazing. Getting more and more, and they're, they're actually more effective than actually going out with a band. But going with, like I said, they were, cost nothing right. to do. And out of that came an album, Reloaded, and the, the tracks were incredible because out of that, all my live versions are like the Reloaded tracks, so they right. sound like a live, uh, right. live band. So. So what inspires you to want to go out on the road when you're putting out videos that are doing half a million views and you just being in your basement? So what inspires you to actually want to hit the road? That's to get more exposure. Because if you out playing out, it makes you more viable. The more you play, the more people will post on YouTube, the more you get jobs. I so hopefully you, I, I want to get to a point where I make money. I thought you were going to say because you love playing for your fans. <laughs> I've yet to see them because I, I've never played a show in a long time. Right. Even though you're still in that sort of realm where the virtual world, half a million views on, on a lot of videos that you're doing straight from home, but there's still that need, that connection to go out there and like connect with people on a large, a large basis. And the only way to really do that is to go out on the road. Yeah, well, it's going to be fun, too, to play with guys. I have an amazing sure. band. And sure. uh, so it's going to be fun. We have a lot of fun. There's no drama. Everybody's laughing. Everybody's funny. And... Uh, it's just going to be great. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of humans, there's somebody in your life named Sylvie. Yeah. That's super important. And I'm sure that you could do it all, 
But the fact that you have that person that supports you, unlike your dad, you have somebody that's like, yeah, go, I'll help you with this. I'll help you with that. How pivotal is that to you it's, wanting to continue to like do this? It's very pivotal. I mean, it's like, you know, she'll push me in. Just having the support, just having love in your life. <clears throat> it's important. If you don't have love in your life, I don't know how you exist. Right. You know, you're empty, an empty shell. You know, and I was fortunate that I met her at a time where I was grieving and just was a short time after. And I met her like that. And I met her through, I mean, I was just, I just started an Instagram account and I put it on Facebook. And then Sylvie said, I just joined. So I went on Instagram and I looked her up and, and she looked like she was sort of a light around her. And I put hello. And she had just broken her sternum. Whoa. So she was at home uh, sitting on morphine. And then she couldn't believe it was me writing her. So she answered <laughs> back. And then we had this Instagram relationship for a couple of days. And then we started calling each other. And then that was it. Now, five years later, uh, we're still there. Amazing. And we got married during, uh, during COVID. During COVID. Oh, yeah. There was only six people that allowed in the house. And so it was just me and her. A drunken pastor, my brother <laughs> and her mother, for uh, witnesses and the photographer James. That's all you need, really. Oh, yeah, that's all you need. And we had a great time. If you don't have support, you don't have love. I don't know how, how you exist. How can you make great music if you don't have love in your life? How can you? Uh, how can you have a? How can you ha not have a soul and create music that supposedly has a soul? It's just against the, the principles of, of man, I mean, you know. Probably. Do you sing or do you do? Uh... I do. I do. I sing, uh, play keys a little bit, guitar I wish. My brain can't seem to, like, wrap around it, really. Mm -hmm. uh, when I look at a piano, I see all, all the patterns. I look at a guitar and I see nothing. Um, but, yeah, I'm trying to get back into singing. I stopped kind of like a little bit during the pandemic I was going through a, a period of grieving so that kind of hit me hard and then I just stopped music I told Albert music kind of became scary to me because uh, you have to really open yourself up and be vulnerable to the experience and uh, I wasn't ready to touch into that it's funny because me grieving brought out my music really? you know well everyone kept saying they're like use it like use it to like inspire your music and it just became this like really terrifying thing for me to uh, try to approach. So I think this last week was the first song I had written in like the two and a half years since. Well, if that's it, just don't push it. Yeah. You don't need to write another song. You know, just wait till inspiration hits and write another one. Yeah. And now we're that's trying to do. do that, trying to get back into the like studio. Now it's been two years I haven't written a song. I don't care. How do it's you do because, that? How do you not care? <laughs> it's not that I don't care, because if I do it in any other way, the songs aren't good. You're When you are writing, you're not actually always writing like, okay, this song is going to be for me, uh, and then maybe it'll, uh, maybe it's not for me in the end. I'll, I'll sound very, when you write, you're writing for like Celine. So like Celine, A New Day, you're like, I'm going to write this song for her. And this is yeah. not a song that I wrote for myself and then I passed it on, you know, to, to well, some other artist. Well, that song was, yeah, it was, it was specifically for her. A song for like Clay Aiken was uh, mm -hmm. written at a writing camp. And uh, <clears throat> that was just like, okay, we're writing a song for Clay Aiken. Okay, we're writing a song for Celine. So you're pitching, we're basically. Pitching. Right. Yeah. And it landed. <laughs> uh, Clay Aiken landed. Yeah, Celine, exactly. Celine was different because Celine, I had. I knew Renee really well. Sure, I knew Vila really well. So, whenever I had a great song, it was easier for me to, ha for my, to right. hand them a song. Right. Do you ever write for yourself and then realize that maybe it's for someone else? I mean, we like I heard the other day, like Avril had written Breakaway and then realized it wasn't really for her. She gave it to Kelly Clarkson. Mm hmm. Like, do you ever do that? I have a whole catalog. I have about 200 songs that are sitting on a hard drive at home. Mm -hmm. That record quality that have all these great. Uh, Swedish singers on them and that I never put out, but I, eventually I'm going to put out most of them. But the, like being, being an artist and even an artist like in, in my place, it's just luck. You're in the right place at the right time. 
if that woman wouldn't have given my tape to the guy and the guy listened to it, right? No, Aldo Nova. You know what I mean? Right. Nothing. So being talented isn't the only element. There's still it luck. Nothing. There's people There's that are still way luck. more. There's people that are way more talented than me, and uh, just haven't had the break. Right. It's just being in the right place at the right time. I'm a, I'm I'm amazed that even though you know through all the ups and downs that you've gone through in the industry that you're still passionate about music and it's like and when I when I said before that it really is about the music for oh, yeah. you I mean it's not it's 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 not a it's not a I need to be famous I need to be seen you know it's like everybody you know dreams of having the career that you you had and doing you know playing or arenas and playing you know doing doing videos with like some of the biggest you know you know video directors in the world and and like being in those positions and and being like oh yeah i yeah, just collaborated with the bon jovi and it's like yeah blaze of glory once again probably didn't get any credit you know it's like it's like those those songs you know like you're playing with like the biggest artists at that time in the world so you don't need the accolades although really nice it's really nice when somebody like goes by the way Here's a little plaque for, you know, your yeah, work. Yeah, I never got a plaque for Blaze of Glory. That, bl that blows <laughs> you, me away. Now you have to buy your plaques. It's, yeah, yeah, I am I know. I'm, no, I never got a plaque from, yeah. for Blaze of Glory. Oh, it was, uh, I produced that, that record. But uh, then again, it was a question of his politics and whatever. Is there any ill will? It's showbiz. That's just the way it is. So now that you're home... Getting ready to go out on the road. What's the what's the next step after you go out on the road and you do this this gig in Edmonton? Hopefully, get more shows and go back out on the road. Well, I know that you were saying that maybe you didn't get the respect that you did. Let me tell you, my friend, you have my respect. Oh, well, that's good. And you have my you have, I have your respect for that because I talked like two hours longer than you wanted. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. This is going to be edited into 30 minutes now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but the best part of the interview is when you after you want. After I left, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, of course, of course. But you have my respect. Thank you so much for being on our podcast. Love having you on, my friend, and. Uh, I got to do some work for you, so okay. we, we we got we got to get to I'm that ha too. I'm happy we finally got to meet instead of just joking around. Yeah, and it was super important for you, uh, as it was for me, my friend. This is oh, it's good. been it's Aww, been guys. it's been awesome. Aww. It's been awesome. Thank you so much, Aldo. And we're out of here. Next time, we'll catch you on Basebin TV.